All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, so this is week six. Uh, and this week we are talking about modern policing and alternatives to uh, policing. Uh, our primary focus is community uh, policing, and we'll spend a decent amount of time talking about that. Um, but anyway, just wanted to give you the heads up, and we're just going to dive right into it. So... <clears throat> When we talk about modern policing, we have to talk about the hazards of the job. And so we've talked about uh, some of this stuff already a little bit. We've talked a decent amount about the different duties and responsibilities of the police. Uh, as hopefully you know by this point, and it should be just review, um, but policing is not just catching a criminal. It's a lot of uh, maintenance. It's a lot of keeping the peace and making sure that society works and flows properly. And because of that, that means that there's a lot of interaction with people. And so before we dive into these hazards of the job, I want to mention that almost all of these have a direct relation to working with the general population, dealing with everyday people. There's a couple kind of specific uh, pieces uh, but otherwise, all of this is related to the fact that police deal with the general population on a daily basis. And so uh, we're just going to talk about each one of these a little bit. Uh, so conflict management, a big part of this is that because uh, police are working with the general public, um, there's a lot of dealing with conflict. And when I say conflict, I mean disagreements, I mean assault, I mean crimes, I mean everything. Uh, and a key part of the job of a police officer is to maintain order and peace. And so there needs to be good understanding and skills of conflict resolution. And so conflict management is the key here. One of the hazards is you have to be able to balance uh hearing both sides of the argument and making a neutral and appropriate response, being able to de-escalate a situation and de-escalate a potential conflict down to maybe just hurt feelings, doesn't necessarily result in arresting someone, but does result in bringing about some kind of peaceful agreement or uh, peace to the general vicinity. So conflict management is a technically a hazard. Uh, you deal with people who are very emotionally charged. Um, and definitely related to this is the power of negotiation. Um, part of conflict management is understanding the balance of negotiation and understanding that you give a little, you get a little. Uh, this idea that you talk it out without going into violence. And so this is where it's important to note that not everybody is going to have the same levels. Not everybody is going to be as willing or as interested. And so there is this level of understanding that balance. And part of this power of negotiation, the hazard of the job, this is also not just with dealing with the public. This is also dealing with the own uh, hierarchy of the police culture and the police network. Um, there is a hierarchy. There are people who are in command. There's a chain of command. And so being able to negotiate and work with people who are at different levels of power is also a hazard of the job. It's part of this understanding that the job is not easy, I guess I could say. Um, one of the things that I want to emphasize with this power of negotiation and conflict management if you've had me in an English class before, I've talked about this. If you've taken race, crime, and justice, you've heard me talk about this before. But if you haven't had those classes, let me be the one to tell you, words have power. So I'm not just a criminal justice teacher, I'm an English teacher. And let me tell you, your words have power. The words you choose, the way you say things, they have an impact on other people. Think about the way that you talk to other people, the attitude, the way that you talk, the words you choose all have a meaning. 
whether you mean it to have that meaning or not. There's a thing called connotation where it's ideas that are connected to a word. Words have that. Words have that power. That's a hazard of being a human and communicating. In policing, your words have power. The way you phrase things can make a situation better or worse. And so this is why it's important to note that the words that are said have power. Okay. Now, understanding police community tensions. This we're going to dive a little bit more into when we talk about uh, community policing. But unless you've been ignoring the news for the last 20, 30 years, uh, realistically the last 100 years of American history, there has long been a history of violence, uh, in particular against minorities from police officers, particularly African Americans, Latino, and uh, Native American. There, there's been a long history of it. Uh, this class is, we're not diving into that like in depth. Uh, we talk about that in Race, Crime, and Justice. But it's important to understand that because of things like that and the perceptions, there is a history of police community tensions. Not everybody trusts the police. This is an inherent reality. And understanding that some people are going to be less trusting, less accepting, means that there's going to be different situations. And so understanding that not everybody views the police positively is an important aspect of the job to make sure that the any officer is doing things correctly, they're doing them safely, and they're not leading to other problems. And directly connected to this, and which is why I say if you've been paying attention, you're familiar with this, the seriousness of deadly force. Um, <clears throat> we talk about it. We have to talk about it. We talk about it in a lot of criminal justice classes just because this is something that is so prevalent and covered in the news that it's impossible to not hear about it. Um, so we've talked about it before in this class. The police have a, de a decent amount of freedom to choose how they respond to a situation. Um, and one of the things is the use of force in apprehending a suspect. Understanding that the amount of force used can be perceived in a different light is a f one key component of this. But the other thing is deadly force. Um, I've talked about this in criminal law class. So if you've had that one, you should have heard about this, but um, legally speaking, deadly force is very, very specifically only allowed in very specific situations for policing. And that's true even here when I'm talking about policing. The use of deadly force has a very specific time and quantity and qualification for when it can and can't be used. So understanding that deadly force, whenever a, a suspect is killed in the process of being brought into custody, that it has so many other implications that create problems for the job as a whole. Um, obviously, the use of force should be appropriate to the amount of force that is being used by the suspect. So it becomes a complicated matter, um, but it's trying to understand that these, these get complicated. Okay. Uh, understanding arrest situations. And this is definitely related to the use of force and the seriousness of deadly force, but arrest situations are stressful for everyone. It's not just for the suspect who's getting apprehended and being arrested. It's, it's stressful for the officer as well. And so in those situations, typically in arrest situations, there are a lot of high emotions. And so it's important to note that they tend to be messy, and this is why the deadly force thing ends up being a little more common than it should be. Um, the FBI uh, conducted research by collecting data and found that nearly one-third of all officers who died in the line of duty uh, died during the arrest process, uh, and the data was from 1992 to 2001. So 
there was a clear understanding in the 90s and the early 2000s that, you know, we need to be more careful and more serious when it comes to arresting. We want to reduce the number of officers who are killed. And this has led to a less than positive view that uh, use of force is excessive. Um, it's a direct response from the data saying that officers die during these process. So this is a very weird balance game and we're still dealing with this um, even today. But one of the most important things to come out of this data and understanding the hazard of this job, uh, that arrests are gonna be stressful, it's that you need to understand the patterns. You need to understand uh, and learn what type of patterns an individual has. Are they a runner? Are they someone that lashes out? Um, what type of situation is this? Is it just, for lack of a better word, shit talking? Is it just being aggressive and yelling at each other? Or is it actually going to lead to violence? Understanding the nuances of those situation can help relieve those tensions and make it a more secure and a more streamlined process. But again, remember, human. We, we have emotions. We can feel different things that we feel. Uh, challenges in responding to disturbance calls. Uh, the other thing with kind of like arrest, but this is different, uh, when you get a call for uh, any kind of disturbance, there's a lot of emotions. This is a high emotionally charged situation uh, because the person who made the call, they have high expectations that you are going to side with them in solving the problem. Um, both sides are going to assume that it's going to be resolved and the police are going to agree with them. Um, there's a lot of tension. And the idea is that on a disturbance call, you want to diffuse the situation not incite it to more violence. You want to avoid the violence. Traffic stops and pursuits should be fairly obvious, but um, realistically, traffic stops are very routine things, especially for a patrol officer. Uh, they become everyday kind of things. And if you've ever done anything a lot and you've done the same thing over and over again, whether it's if you've had a job and you always take the same way to work and the same way back from work, if you ever notice that sometimes you kind of go into autopilot mode where your brain just kind of phases out and you just kind of, you get home and then you wake, you wake up and you go, wait, I don't remember driving home. You were conscious, but your body just kind of took over and you weren't paying attention. This is a real thing in psychology that happens to people. This is not just me saying this. It's not just the book saying this. This is a real thing. People, when they get into a routine and they do something over and over and over and over again, it becomes second nature and you can go onto autopilot and doing this. And so oddly enough, traffic stops become this kind of automatic thing for patrol officers, which then there's the danger of making mistakes. You do the same thing over and over again. You don't really change it. You don't make any variance. And so then something is different and you don't catch it or you don't follow it correctly and now there's a problem. It's important to stay conscious and active in all sorts of situations. As far as traffic pursuits are concerned, I know Hollywood likes to make a big deal about it. We always see the high traffic pursuits. Um, there's been some famous high traffic pursuits that I'm sure you can look up and see. I always think of the uh, O.J. Simpson uh, fleeing thing, but that also ages me. So if you're too young to know what I'm talking about when I say the O.J. Simpson uh, traffic pursuit, eh, it's okay. Uh, my older students definitely know what I'm talking about. But something that you might not have thought about is that traffic pursuits, especially high-speed pursuits, are very dangerous, and not just to the officer and the and the uh, person running away, the, the potential criminal. It's dangerous to the community as well um, because it involves a lot of fast maneuvering and quick turns and things of that nature. Um, there tends to be a lot of damage, a lot of collateral damage. Uh, 
both to officer vehicle, officer themselves, uh, suspect, suspect vehicle. Like I said, bystander, public. There's a lot of side pieces that get involved with a high-speed pursuit. And yes, you're trained. There, There is training for high-speed pursuit to minimize the risks, but they're inherently dangerous. And so it's one of those best practices to not have to engage in a traffic pursuit. That's best case scenario. If you have to, then you have to be able to be conscious and be aware of the potential issues that are related to it. Uh, handling and transporting prisoners. Uh, I know we talked about it when we talked about the specific different careers, how the U.S. Marshals do the federal one. Well, part of policing is handling and transporting prisoners, especially at the state level and the local level. Um, understanding that you're working with people and you are dealing directly with people who have been charged with a crime, which means you're going to deal with uh, violent criminals, but you're also going to deal with everyday people that just kind of, due to a circumstance, are there. A big part of the hazard, which we talked about already, is dealing with the community, but it's also the diverse populations. And so we are, I'm going to tell you right now, our week eight, we're going to talk more specifically about diverse populations. We're going to talk about uh, mental mentally impaired, we're going to talk about uh, some of those specific uh, groups that you deal with, but this is where we also talk about this is a hazard of the job because you're dealing with so many different people. Unfortunately, one size does not fit all. Um, I don't know how else better to say that. Um, this is dealing also with the mentally impaired individuals as well as drugs and gang violence. One size does not fit all. This is true for criminal justice. This is true for education. This is true for healthcare. This is true for everything. One size does not fit all. And if you've thought that that was the answer, I'm sorry to break the bubble. Um, we have best practices in all of those fields. Education says, okay, here are the best strategies for teaching people. In healthcare, healthcare providers are taught the standard way to take care of people that does the most help to the most number of people. It's not always a one-size-fits-all, which is why they run multiple tests. Good teachers tend to try to mix things up. They don't make every single uh, assignment in the class a test. They involve uh, group work. They involve just conversation and uh, participation in class. In policing, it's a matter of understanding that, yes, we arrest people who break the law, but we also need to understand, is this person breaking the law out of necessity, or are they breaking the law because they're not aware? If they're not aware that it's a, a law that they're breaking, how do we inform them? How do we teach them that it is? And there's it's a whole complicated mess. So in these except for the hostages and barricade situation, what I want to say about this is that understanding that it's not one size fits all is an important aspect of this, of this field, of any field, really. So, again, uh, d mentally impaired individuals, uh, in particular, there's been quite a few incidences of uh, individuals who are on the autism spectrum uh, being under excessive force, um, but it's closely related to uh, their own mental difficulties and how that manifests and how police observe it if they're not familiar with it. It's a very complicated matter. Like I said, we'll talk more about it in week eight when we talk about unique populations, but I want to at least say here that because they are a unique population, because they have different requirements and needs, this means that it poses a generic, a general hazard um, because you can't respond to it in the same way. They, there might be a different response. Uh, hostage and barricade situations, 
there are specified and specialized units and teams and training for hostage situations, but it's understanding that, you know, this is a reality of the job, as well as drugs and gang violence. Um, they're unique situations. There, there are certain ways that you need to be trained. All right. <clears throat> Moving on from that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about police culture. Uh, because understanding modern policing is understanding that there are hazards to the job, but there's also a very particular police culture. Um, and so we, we're going to talk about organized structure, organizational structure and organizational culture first. And then we're going to get into uh, socialization and positive culture. So organizational structure is the power dynamics. It's the chain of command. It's the company loyalty. Um, it's the actual way that it is physically designed, okay? Organizational structure is how you have people in place that make sure that everything operates smoothly. That's structure. And I wanna emphasize that structure influences culture. That might be a question that shows up on an exam. The organizational structure influences the organizational culture, okay? So the structural structure is the actual layout. This is the power dynamics chain of command. The culture is the way that the place works or doesn't work, and it's based on the physical components and the intrinsic components. And I definitely know I have a couple students going, what the heck do you mean intrinsic? Intrinsic value is the base under the surface understood parts of it intrinsic is it is part of that dna it's the understood the underlying components and so when we say that the organizational culture is the physical and intrinsic qualities of the organization we're saying it is what is the soul of a community so if we're talking about just policing in general, and the structure is the bones and the body, the culture is the soul. And so when we talk about culture and policing, the way the building is designed, if it's open air and, you know, lots of intercommunication or cubicle and set off alone and separated and dark, those have an effect on the culture. Equipment that's used, is it technologically advanced? Are you limiting yourself to only one thing? Is it open source? All these types of things impact a culture. The culture is the values that everyone, and I put that in air quotes, believe. Okay? The organizational culture, this is true in policing, this is true anywhere. If you work at a place long enough or you go to school long enough at a place or things like that, you'll start to pick up on the culture. There's a set of values that the majority of people believe. There's this group of underlying assumptions, beliefs that everyone agrees with. Uh, if you're a local Erie resident and uh, you went to, heck, Honestly, even if you don't, you're probably familiar. If you know anything about high school football, if I say cathedral prep, most people will immediately go McDowell. And that's a classic rivalry here in town. Cathedral prep sees its, its rival as McDowell. McDowell, I don't know, necessarily sees its rival as cathedral prep, but it exists. There's a palpable belief that those two are rivals. That's culture. Depending on where you fall, you either say, yeah, public school, down with the Catholic school, or private Catholic school, down with the public school. Like, there's a culture belief behind that. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but this is what we're talking about in real practice, in police organizations, in, de in particular departments. The values that that particular department holds and their underlying beliefs that's going to impact all the officers. Because the other thing about humans is we like to belong. So we are going to associate with people we agree with. So the organizational culture is often hard to change. 
hear me as I say this, organizational culture is hard, often hard to change. It's because it's unconsciously followed. It is meaningful to the staff. So like, it's not just something that exists. It's something that matters to the people. It's easy for insiders who are part of it to understand, but it's hard or weird or different to outsiders. Think about it. If you've ever started a new job and everyone all kind of believed the same thing, and you're like, what the heck is going on? And then like six months later, you get it and you're on that side. Then a new person comes in and is like, I don't get it. And you're like, trust me, I got it after a while. That's culture. Organizational culture is a real thing in business. It's a real thing in community. It's a real thing in psychology. It's hard to change. You can change structure. You can change the physical layout. You can change who, what, what people are in charge and things like that. You can change that. And yeah, it causes some upset, but it works. Culture is a lot harder to change because it's not just changing a single person. It's changing the whole of the community. So it's just, it's important to understand that when we talk about police culture, um, we're talking about the structure and the culture, the uh, soul of the police organization. And so this is something that I've talked about before. I've mentioned it in this class before. And if you've talked with me outside of this class, you've probably heard me talk about this as well. But uh, socialization of police officers, a key component of police culture is making sure that all the officers have a similar agreeance of ethics, morality, things like that. And so in hiring officers, in uh, going to be officers, you look for people that have similar beliefs about justice and things of that nature. Part of police training is becoming part of that culture. This is where I say the data supports this. Most people who want to be police officers have wanted to be police officers for a while. Most people don't decide after taking a class or two that they want to become a police officer. Most of them already had the idea of wanting to be a police officer. Most people that go into policing already had the idea in their mind. Police officers... I don't want to say it because it's not necessarily 100% true, but police officers are born, not made. And what I mean is that most people who do end up going into the field, the data shows us that most of them already knew they wanted to be a police officer. They wanted to go into law enforcement. Okay. So if you're one of those people that are like, I never really thought about law enforcement, this class probably is not going to change your mind and make you go, I want to be a police officer. But if you already had an idea that that might be a path for you, and this class made you go, yeah, this is exactly what I want to do, then you fit right into the data. The data says you already knew you wanted to do this. This was just your motivation. This was just your final push. The data shows us that most people want to be police before they go into the academy. It's because they have similar ethics. They have similar beliefs. They believe in a certain sense of justice. They believe in all of those components. You can't teach someone that. They have to already be that way. Okay. Okay. And so when we talk about police culture and understanding that most people want to be police before they dive into it, here's where things in the modern times get a little more tricky. And especially as we try to talk about alternatives to modern policing and alternatives to traditional policing, there is a push to create a positive police culture. Okay. And it's really what it comes down to is that a police, uh, like a particular police department, uh, the police culture should reflect the community's ethics too. So they should share the same core values and uh, the same kind of ideas that everyone agrees on considering justice and things like that. And really those values should be the guide for everyone in the community, not just uh, the officers, but the civilians as well. 
And that's something that is not easy. And we'll get into it as we get a little bit, a little bit later into this uh, presentation. But it's important to note that, you know, creating a positive culture is about matching what your community feels as well. It's not just what the policing community agrees. And that's complicated and it's difficult. Okay. So the crisis of legitimacy. This is in particular with community policing. This is definitely with understanding modern policing. There is an issue of legitimacy. How do you maintain your order and control as the authority without losing your the respect of the community and how do you get that without losing the authority it's a complicated matter and so i'm telling you right now this is not a question on your quiz but this will be a question on the exam this is not a question on the quiz but this is going to be a question on the final exam there were three big changes in policing history we have three major change eras we have the political era from the 1840s to about the early 1900s. The political era was full of politicians in charge of police. Policing was very much like it was traditionally. It responded to the king, but instead of a king, it was the politician, the mayor, the governor, the president. Politics decided criminal justice okay the political era from the 1840s to the early 1900s was politics guiding criminal justice in the 1930s we went into the reform era the reform era from the 1930s to about the 1970s this was a time where they were refining the duties and laws this is during the height of of um, civil rights movement. This is pushing forward the idea that we don't only refine the laws, but we follow the laws. This is where the true piece that we still talk about with policing, that no one is above the law. This is the understanding that police don't get to break the law. They have to follow it too. The reform era was all about making laws clear, straightforward, and understandable. And then we dove into the community era, and we are still technically in the community era. So from the 1970s until about now, the community era in policing, the big change era, is where now there's a focus on collaboration. It is no longer about policing be this last bastion, this last holdout, this last stronghold of rules and mores and ethics. Now it's hey, we need to work together because we can't be everywhere all the time. We can't make sure that everyone is following the rules. Now it's a matter of, okay, we can enforce the laws, but how about you help us so that we know who's breaking the laws and when. We can't be there everywhere. So then this is the rise of the neighborhood watch. This is community is working with the police to help bring about justice, to keep society operating normal okay so question on an exam what were the three major changing eras in policing history are the political era the reform era and the community era it's important to know which ones did what okay that being said let's talk about navigating change so one of the most important things, and we're going to talk about it again later, is that change takes time. Okay? Change takes time. And as we've gone through reform and we've gone through the community era and we have new programs, there's new programs all the time that are being put forward. But when a new program is put forward, sometimes there's funding for it and sometimes there's not. When there is funding, eventually the funding runs out. And so where does that funding need to come from? Now there's a budgetary question. And I know if you're planning on being an officer, you're like, why do I care about budget? Because it matters. Budget determines training and funding. 
And so now all of a sudden, as we have new programs being implemented, we have new technologies that are being required. How are, how are departments paying for it? Now we have to look into grant writing. And this is a little side piece. It's not a direct uh, career in criminal justice, but a good career option for multiple places, and especially any kind of nonprofit, um, is grant writing. The police need it too. But now grant writing is an important role in any type of these situations because now you need to know how to write to apply for federal money, how to apply to get money to pay for it. So now there's a whole complicated matter. And now we're looking at, you know, now we have to get different funding. Now we're looking at a decrease in public interest. And that's another piece that's uh, directly related to the navigating change of uh, policing. There is a decreased public interest in becoming a police officer. This has been going on for a while now. Uh, definitely since the 90s, there's been a uh, somewhat steady decrease in interest in policing. Um, whether it be due to uh, security, and I do mean, I don't mean like private security, but I mean it's a dangerous job. Not everybody wants to put their life on the line potentially for a job. Um, but the other part is policing has bad press right now. They, they are not the uh, glorified watch person that they once were. People view them in a very negative light, and so less less and less people want to become a police officer. And so that does have a direct effect on the legitimacy of police uh, departments, especially when they can't fill the required roles in the department. They're having staffing problems. Um, another closely connected thing with uh, new programs and everything is training. Uh, if you've ever heard the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, first off, that's not true. Uh, you can teach an old dog new tricks, it just becomes more difficult. But the reality is, in modern policing, when you start to add new technologies and new processes, you got to train. You got to train all of your officers. And this includes your old officers that have been doing the job for 20, 30 years. They need training. And if you've ever had a conversation with someone who's been doing the same thing for 20 or 30 years, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to be easy to change their mind. It's possible, but it's not always going to happen. And it's not going to be easy. That's a reality of the job. It's a reality of the new world of policing that we're in. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of going back, new tech means new training or retraining. You, you need to, navigating change is a long and difficult process. And understanding the nuances of it is super key and important. Um, policing in multicultural communities is also a another issue that policing is in general dealing with um and it shouldn't be a surprise really but nowadays especially here in america we are a melting pot we have a lot of diverse groups and communities that are living together and when you have different groups with different beliefs you're gonna have some conflicting uh, information you're going to have some tensions rising you're going to lead to a bunch of other problems and so when you have different people with different backgrounds and beliefs you need to understand how to uh, find a good balance between the two of them so understanding the cultural differences is one of the key things that you can do uh, well not you can do but it's important in policing is understanding and before I dive any further into this, I just want to say this is something that you can also do even if you're not going into policing. This is just a good uh, way to be a understanding human and a good person. Understand cultural differences, staying calm, and working with the community. For policing, that's the key to understanding how to police multicultural communities, especially, like I said, Erie, we have a large number of uh, immigrant population. We do have a lot of people who come here from uh, other countries, some seeking asylum, some just uh, coming here to live, whatever it might be. Knowing that 
there are differences. It's a matter of learning a little bit about them. I'm not saying you need to learn every single cultural belief and, and every holiday and learn the language, but learning some key things like what their understanding of justice is, being able to have a conversation with them, and remaining calm even when emotions get high, that's key. If you can stay calm, especially as a police officer, it goes a long way to de-escalating a situation. With that, working with the community, especially as police, is important. Remember, we talked about it. <clears throat> Collaboration is key. The more and more data we have, the more and more we see that when police departments work with the local communities, there tends to be a decrease in crime. So this is important. And so, perfect segue, building trust between police and communities. We got to do it. The history of the United States and the history of policing is full of problematic race relations. Period. This is a fact. I know it's uncomfortable for some people to talk about. I'm not going to deny that. And I'm, I'm not going to spare your feelings, but I'm going to tell you, this is the God's honest truth. This is the reality. The history of the United States and the history of policing is full of problematic race relations. We have struggled in our entire history with treating people fairly based off of the color of their skin, based off of their religion, based off of their gender. People tend to discriminate. It's almost a default. It's not wrong or it's not wrong. It's, it's not right. It's wrong to discriminate against someone based off of anything. So it's important that as policing in a modern day struggles with keeping relevant and keeping its legitimacy and working for the community, it's really important to mend and heal those tense problematic race relations. This is, this is a key to improving and getting better. Okay. So, um, in doing this and finding a way to build trust within the police and the community, um, our book does put forward the four principles for fair policing. And this is true. If policing follows these four principles, it makes a clear distinction that it's not based off of bias or personal beliefs. It's based solely off of the law. And that's that you, one, treat people with dignity and respect. You, two, let people have their say during encounters. Three, you make decisions in a way that is neutral and clear. And four, you show your intentions are good and trustworthy. Please note, just like change, this takes time. Building trust takes time. And I think for the good of policing and the good of future policing, we need to continue working towards this. We need to work towards fair policing and building this connection with these communities who are disconnected, who feel underrepresented or overly policed or targeted. It's important to build this this mending bridge, this kind of understanding. And so treat people with dignity and respect in general. This is just a good rule of thumb. Let people have their say during an encounter. And I want to emphasize this because we've talked about this as a hazard, but we also talked about this before. Officers, police officers need to remain calm. People are emotionally charged. We are all emotional people. Sometimes you need to let someone be mad and say what they want to say and then deal with it. Um, obviously, making decisions that are neutral and clear and show that your intentions are good and trustworthy, those are things that definitely come with time. Okay. So we kind of already talked about it a little bit, but perceptions of the police. Um, 
truly what this comes down to, and there's a whole chapter in our text on this, and I can't believe it, but I'm going to break this down in like super simple terms, and you're going to be like, wow, that was easy. So in understanding that policing is, it needs a little rebrand, it needs a little help, the perceptions of the police by the public matter. As we said a couple weeks ago, the police are only as successful when the community itself believes that they're doing its job. So public opinion matters. The police need to have public opinion on their side. The general population needs to agree that they are doing what's right for them for the police to operate properly. So you got to build public opinion. And honestly, a good way to do that is marketing. And I can't believe I'm saying that here in a criminal justice class, but marketing. If you've taken an intro to business course or a marketing course or you've talked with anyone who's in one of those classes or you've ever thought about a commercial or an infomercial or a billboard or you've taken English Comp 1 with me uh, where we talk about the rhetorical situation and ethos, pathos, and logos, marketing matters. The way people view something matters. And you can change perspective in very specific and I say this in the best word way possible, manipulative way. Marketing is all about using psychology to manipulate the general population to believe what you are saying, whether it's true or not. You can manipulate people for good, you can manipulate people for bad. I'm not saying it's a one or the other. But understanding that perceptions of the police come down to what is the message you want the public to know about the police? And then you market it. You make sure people know you're where you are. We are here to serve the public. So you have officers be at public events. And you have them being there and being actively participating. You have them going to schools. You have them talking to community members. You have community outreach days. You do things to show that public face so that people believe this and then the public opinion is on your side. This is marketing. This is selling. And truly, that's what you do as a person when you go out to get a job. You sell yourself. Sell yourself as the product that the company wants to hire. Police want to sell the idea that we are here to protect you. Put that forward. This is a basic component of modern day life and i'm trying to give you a little peek behind the curtain um it's important even in policing all right so policing for crime prevent prevention um so we're st we're still talking about modern policing um this is how do i want to say this we're going to be talking about different policing uh beliefs that are directly connected to modern policing, not historical policing, modern policing. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna dive right into it. So our textbook puts forward, there are eight major hypotheses uh, in regards to policing for crime prevention. And please note, crime prevention. This is what type of policing? This could be something that would show up on an exam, not a quiz, an exam. Policing for crime prevention is what type of policing? Yes, it's crime prevention, but what is crime prevention? It's proactive policing. Okay? So we're talking about proactive policing right now. And so the eight major hypotheses when we talk about policing for crime prevention is that when you have more officers, the higher number of officers and police that you have available to do whatever it might need for whatever is going on, you're going to have less crime. So the more officers, the less crime you have. Another one of the high major hypotheses of preventative policing is the shorter travel time to a scene from a 911 call, the less crime there's going to be. If there is the observed idea that it is quick to show up and quick to resolve, less crime is going to happen. Third major hypothesis, 
the more random patrols that are out there, the more perceived omnipresence of the police will deter crime. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that one here in just a minute. Fourth, when you have more precise and directed patrols, there's going to be less crime. When there are more arrests that are responding to reports and observations, there's going to be less crime. The higher the quality and the more quantity, the more frequent or the more people in community policing, the less crime there's going to be. And the more that police can identify and minimize proximate causes of crime, the less crime there will be. So let's go back to uh, three and four. More random patrols means more omnipresence of the police and deter crime. And more precise patrol leads to less crime. We've talked about this before in class, and this is where I go, what have we talked about before? And the textbook brings it up too. The Kansas City Preventative Patrol Experiment. What did the data show us? The data said that there was no significant difference, whether they were within the control, the random patrols, the increased patrols, and the no patrols. There was not a direct relation to the amount of crime. Part of this, and this is why I say the preventative policing, these are eight hypotheses. Hypotheses are to be tested. They're not necessarily 100% accurate. We know that more random patrols don't necessarily equate to a more feeling of control in an area. It doesn't necessarily deter crime. Okay. However, when you have more random patrols, there is going to be more random arrests. There is going to be more catching of crime. So there might be an inherent small deterrence in crime. This is why it's a complicated matter. Technically, it is and it isn't true based off the Kansas City experiment. However, more precise patrol means less crime. This is mostly true. When we have a direct patrol in a certain area, that area is going to have less crime because they know that the patrol is happening. Okay? There is the direct relation to it. It's just a weird one to think about. Um, the other thing that I really want to talk about and the one I wanted to focus on before we talk about community versus problem-oriented policing is the more the police can identify and minimize proximate causes of crime, the less crime. What are proximate causes of crime? I'm going to ask you that question. I'm going to have you sit with it. So I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not giving you the direct answer here because the answer has already been given to you in previous weeks. But I'm going to help guide you. A proximate crime is nearby factors or causes that lead to a criminal activity. Okay? Proximate causes are nearby associated things that lead to crime. So, the one of the major hypotheses of preventative policing or policing for crime prevention is the more that the police can identify and minimize proximate causes, you're going to see a decrease in crime. So I ask you once more, what are proximate causes of crime? Think about it. It's not a question on this quiz. This might be something that is a possible essay question going forward is what does it mean that if police can identify and minimize proximate causes of crime there will be less crime think about it proximate causes my last hint to you before we move on is poverty may or may not be connected to a proximate cause of crime hint hint nudge nudge 
might guide you in the right direction of where to look in your notes. All right. <clears throat> as far as community versus problem-oriented policing. So community policing is all about collaboration with the community. It's not just the police. And we are going to spend time talking about that today. Problem-oriented policing is understanding best practice to reduce crime. And what's important here is that it's not with community involvement. This is traditional policing. There may be collaboration with other departments, with other groups, maybe with social workers, but this is not community policing. This is not having the everyday citizens be an active component of it. Problem-oriented policing is using best practice, okay? Community is using the individuals that you have to bring about a reduce in, a reduction in crime. I'm going to give you a tiny little hint. Um, a good modern policing that we should be doing is a nice fusion of the two. All right, so proactive policing. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to talk about the Craved model, we're going to talk about Sarah, and we're also going to talk about hotspots and crime mapping. They all have their own separate uh, slide that's coming up. So I'm not going to talk about those here. I'm going to talk about focus deterrence and neighborhood watch. And then we're going to go into the individual uh, craved Sarah and hotspots and crime mapping. So neighborhood watch. This is one of those that we've talked about a little bit before and should be fairly understood at this point, I would hope. Um, just basically because this is a fairly common community policing practice and strategy and something that is active here in Erie City, I know for sure, and I know it's in some of the uh, smaller areas within the county. I'm not sure that it's in every one of the counties, but I know I've seen it in like Lawrence Park. I've seen it in Mill Creek. Um, I think I've seen it even as far as Union City. I'm not sure if every single one has a neighborhood watch, but this is something that is fairly common and most people are probably familiar with Neighborhood Watch. So Neighborhood Watch is really everyday citizens. It's not police officers. It's everyday citizens who take it upon themselves to watch over the general vicinity of the area. Sometimes they do uh, a patrol maybe once a week, maybe once a month, uh, whatever it might be. Everyone does it differently because it's community run. It's run by the individual groups. And what they do is they look to see if there's any suspicious activity. Um, they tend to be the, for lack of a better word, nosy neighbor. They're the people that, hey, they noticed that a package has been was on your front steps and before you got home it was gone. They're the type of people that pay attention to that and try to get information and tell the police about it. The goal of the Neighborhood Watch is to keep the individual neighborhoods and community safe. Their goal is to help be the eyes and ears of the police so that if something happens, they immediately, they're the point person to talk to the police. They understand what type of information is needed. They understand the importance of the details and they're there to help. That's the goal of the Neighborhood Watch. It's designed to give autonomy to the individual people of a community, but still have that policing component where they have some kind of somewhat training. Some of them do formal training. Some of them do informal training. It all depends on so many number of factors, but neighborhood watches are inherently designed to make sure that the community is protected and is under close watch by private citizens who make sure that the laws aren't broken. Force deterrence is a little bit different. Force deterrence is targeting a key crime and of key offenders who are doing it and focus their efforts on it. The idea is that by focusing on one type of crime, on one particular type of offenders, you can reduce the crime. You can get rid of it. And to be fair, yeah, it, it kind of works. Um, it's important to know that because this is a proactive policing solution, this tends to get a little controversial, okay? Um, but what folks deterrence does is you pick a specific crime, 
uh, and a particular problem within that crime. You build a team around that. You develop response. So you actually come up with, okay, if we see someone doing this particular crime, this is the punishment. There's no middle ground. It's you see this, you do this. Um, and then what you do is you work with social services to make sure that, you know, everything is set up and everything is in is properly operating and you be in constant communication both with social services and with the community that you are using the focus deterrent on you essentially let them know we're watching always we're watching for this okay so now we're going to talk about the craved model sarah and hotspots and crime mapping so craved is our acronym, and again, this, this also works for Neighborhood Watch, this works for Community of Policing, um, but this is helping people to understand why certain objects are stolen more frequently. And it's pretty straightforward. Like, I'm hoping that you read through this and go, oh, that makes perfect sense. Uh, if it doesn't, please reach out to me. Uh, I'll try to explain it a little bit simpler. But so why certain objects are stolen more frequently than others. So if you think about robberies, you think about burglaries, you think about any kind of theft, you ha there's, it's weird to think about if, you've, if you're not a writer or you're not a criminal or you're not a person really interested in criminal justice, but why would someone choose to steal one thing over the other? And it gets weird when you're like, well, I guess... And you can always go, well, why did someone steal the jewelry? Well, why would you steal jewelry? And so what it comes down to is in training and in discussion, modern policing, when they talk about objects being stolen, you follow the craved model. Is it concealable? How easy is it to hide? Because that's the other thing. If you're stealing something, especially in the middle of the day, how do you make sure you get away with it? How can you hide it so concealability is all about how easy is it to hide jewelry you can put in pockets you can put in a bag it's easily it's very easy to hide how easy is it to hide an 83 inch tv I'll tell you right now it's not easy to hide an 83 inch tv how easy is it to hide a sofa couch not easy how easy is it to hide a car not easy well it's easily movable, which then changes something else. But we'll talk about that in just a second. Concealability is a big component with theft. How easy can it be hidden? Removable. How easy is it to move? And this is where I said the car comes into play here. Car, if you can access a car and you can get it to run without a key, it's easily movable. You can remove it from the scene easily and quickly. Going back to my other examples, how easy is it to move a couch? How easy is it to move an 83-inch TV? How easy is it to move jewelry? So concealability, removability, availability. How available is it? And available is not just related to how easy is it to get a hold of, how easy is it to sell? Most people who steal things who are committing theft they're not committing theft to keep the object they're, they're committing theft to make money so it needs to have a value which is the valuable one and i shouldn't have to explain that one but it also needs to be readily available you need to be able to pass it off which is the disposable part which we're going to get to in a minute too but like is it easily accessed is it locked behind eighty three thousand locks or is it in public daylight is it worth something? Is it disposable? How easy can you get rid of it to get your money's worth? I passed over enjoyable. This is something that's a somewhat complicated matter, and it comes down to criminology and crime science. There is a lot of studies that talk about the mental health and the mental status of individuals who commit crimes. And so... There is a connection to uh, stimulation and enjoyment in the brain when committing a crime. So when we talk about theft, how enjoyable is it to steal it? If you have to steal a big old 83-inch 
tube TV, not a flat screen, a tube TV. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not easily movable. It is not enjoyable to move it. If you've ever known someone with an old classic tube TV, the big heavy ones, no, not fun to move. It's not enjoyable. To some people, is it enjoyable to steal some jewelry? Oh, yeah, the thrill of the steal. Great. There is enjoyment to it. That's what we talk about when we say enjoyable. So understanding the craved model helps us understand why certain things are sold and others aren't. Why would someone steal a PS5 when there was a perfectly good TV there? Well, it was easy to conceal it in their backpack or their hoodie. Uh, it was easily removable. All I had to do was unplug the cords. Didn't take me that long. Um, it was there. They had it laying out in their living room. It wasn't anything I had to really do to get past it. It's worth something. It's a PS5. Heck, uh, it's enjoyable because I enjoyed stealing it. And if I really didn't want to get rid of it, I have a PS5 now. I can play it. And it is disposable. People are willing to buy a PS5. People want to buy it, even for a, a ridiculous amount. And heck, you can charge, if you really wanted to, you could charge someone 100 bucks for a PS5 if you stole it. Why? Because you paid nothing for that PS5. You made $100 off of that PS5. You could charge as much as you want up to the retail price and people will pay for it. That's the reality. That's the craved model. This is what helps explain to people why things are stolen and like specifically. All right. So now we got to talk about Sarah, which is really problem oriented policing as a whole comes down to the Sarah method. Okay. Um, and so it's also important for communities to know as well because it helps them understand the process. Okay. So problem oriented policing itself is not just reacting to crime, but focusing on the underlying causes of crime. This is why I said problem oriented policing is the following best practice. It's understanding what causes it and doing the right thing to deal with it. And so this, this means you have to look closely at patterns, think like a detective, work with the community, even though it's not a community policing, you have to work with the community to get your answers and to get things resolved, and you need to come up with creative solutions. If you're looking at that and going, huh, I've seen some of those things before. Yes. Collaboration, work with community. Creative solutions, Look closely, evaluate. These are things that we teach in our general education stuff. These are the general education outcomes. These are things that you need in policing. These are things you need in every career. That's why we talk about it. Anyway, uh, SARA is an acronym for Scan, Analyze, Respond, and Assess. Um, and what this really is, is it's understanding the process of problem-oriented policing. It's understanding the methods and the way that we go about solving crimes with best practice in mind. And so for every crime, you, for anything, no matter what it is, you do Sarah. You scan, you identify and prioritize the issue at hand. So when you get on scene, you should scan and identify, and so I, when I say scan, I mean you look over, you look at everything, and you go, okay, this is what the problem is. These are, this is what's going on. This is the most important thing I'm prioritizing. I need to deal with this, this, and this. The second step is analyze. This is where you delve deeper. You get deeper into the discussion, and you find out, you gain understanding for what caused the problem and what other contributing factors are there. Who do you need to talk to? What group needs to be involved? That's the analysis stage. After you've scanned, after you've analyzed, you need to respond. This is where you develop a tailored response plan. You come up with a direct idea for dealing with the problem. So when you get to R, you've already scanned, you've already analyzed, you've already dug deeper into it. Your response should be made based off of best practices. And then assess is literally evaluating the effectiveness of what you've done. It's looking at everything that you've done as well and saying, okay, does this work? Is this doing what it should be doing? That's Sarah. That's understanding 
the process of problem-oriented policing. Scan, analyze, respond, assess. All right, so this one, we are actually moving away from the uh, PowerPoint. We're going to the web. Um, so I did include these uh, web links for you right here. Uh, I will tell you right now, if you click on the PAUCR crime map, uh, it'll ask you to log in. It's because the direct link requires a login. If you use the regular web page, it allows you to go in as a guest, as a everyday citizen who's not a police officer or a member of uh, the Pennsylvania network of policing. So that being said, if you click on the PAUCR webpage, uh, you'll be taken to here. So this is the Pennsylvania Uniform Crime Reporting System. This is their main website. So uh, this is, if you use that right link, it takes you here. This is the Pennsylvania Crime Data Repository. And if you come over here in the left-hand corner, you can look at, there's a whole breakdown of the crime in Pennsylvania. You can look at reports and see the trends. But what we want to go to and look at is this, crime map. And I've already pulled up the tab and I already preloaded it so that we could actually look at it and not have to uh, wait for it to load. So, this is the Pennsylvania UCR crime map. And crime mapping is putting the geological information, the geographical, and the crimes and identifying where they happened. So I picked downtown Erie. It's literally, I went to right around, this is, uh, oh gosh, um, Perry Square area. This is the downtown park. And so this is the last 180 days. And so obviously you can completely change how much you want to go by. So I'm fine with last 180 days, but it has all these different types of offenses. All of them are selected for just purposes to show you. Um, but if you're interested in, oh, well, what were the drug narcotic offenses? You can actually use this to break down that number. But come on. It doesn't like me now. Usually when I click on that, it goes away. All right. So look at this. Uh, right here, I clicked on this one just at random. So false pretense, swindle, confidence game. So March 7th of this year, there was a some kind of illegal gambling or type of loan sharking fake thing going on right here. Swindle, a robbery. We have disorderly conduct. We have theft of theft from motor vehicle. We have larceny. We have drug narcotic violation. We have simple assault. We have larceny. We have drug narcotic. We have credit card fraud. We have simple assault. Like you can click on each individual one and see what the crime is and when it was. So like I said, you can you can definitely when I say play with this, I mean do a little investigating. Take some time to look at this website and use it and learn a little bit about crime mapping. I wanted to show you what this looked like so that as I talked about it, you weren't just going, well, what the heck do you mean? Crime mapping is literally putting out the geographic location of where a crime occurs. And the goal is that when you map out where all the crimes are, you can identify a hot spot. And a hot spot is where crime tends to happen a lot. So even looking at this, even though it's downtown, look, we have here's an area where a lot of crime has happened in the last 180 days. Here's a spot where a lot has happened in 180 days. Look at this. There's a solid six blocks where in this area, not a lot has been reported. It's not that there's not crime. It's just this isn't a hot spot. But this, this is a hot spot. This is a hot spot, potentially. Now, again, you can 
dig super deep into this, and I'll tell you right now, um, because I'm looking at the city, it has a thousand block maximum. So because there's a lot of blocks being rendered at the same time, it doesn't like it. So by all means, look up your own neighborhood. See what's coming up there. You can find out a lot if you really want to. Um, but I wanted to share this with you so that as I talk about it, you get a better understanding. Crime mapping is just understanding where crime tends to occur. And this allows us to be preemptive and proactive as policing. And it allows us to know, okay, there tends to be a higher rate of this crime in this area. Now you can send specific patrols there. Crime mapping and understanding hotspots is a key component of proactive policing. Now I get to talk about community of policing. And this is where I say this is the last part of our discussion today. Uh, it's three total slides of community of policing. And so really developing a community of policing is understanding that it's not easy. It's going from a traditional, there's a group that is in charge and that's it, to a now we collaborate and we work together. So notice the image I used for this is a pie chart where the arrows are pointing into each other. I want to emphasize it's because these things all happen constantly as part of developing a community of policing. There is the transition to professional policing. Um, a component of community policing is understanding that you still need a professional police department or some type of professional policing. And so understanding that there needs to be a connection to that and that any community policing needs to have that willingness to work with a professional agency, there is this tension that's going to happen. Technology is a big component, especially in modern times, uh, for policing because technology is everywhere. It's a big component of it. Um, we are currently living in the era of rapid response. And if you're not sure what I mean, I urge you to think about not just from a policing standpoint, but from an everyday standpoint. In policing, you call 911. How quickly do you expect a response? How quickly do you expect someone to be there to help with the situation? Not policing. When you text someone, how quickly do you expect them to respond? If you call someone, if you call someone, how quickly should they respond? If you send someone a meme, how quickly do you expect them to respond? We are in the era of rapid response. We expect almost instantaneous response. And this has led to a general issue within policing and community policing, understanding that for a community to feel safe, they want to know that there is a quick response means that understanding that this is a component, this is something that is necessary to understanding how to build this. Uh, when we talk about examining uh, strategies, I want to emphasize this is looking at the data and the research. And I mean, Kansas City Patrol, this is looking at years and years of actual data. This is looking at different departments of similar geographic size. This is understanding what works. This is the best practices part. This is where I said, really what we are living in is a combination of community policing and problem-oriented policing. The two work together, okay? And then progression of community policing as you have a professional police group that understands that you need to collaborate and you need to make this work. You get more community members involved. And this is a matter of talking to the community. It's involving community members. It's having transparency. And that cycle begins again. It's not something that just happens overnight. And it's not something that once it happens, it's over. This is a constant piece. It doesn't just end. So... Community of policing. What is community of policing? We've talked about it before, and I hope that by this point you understand. A community of policing is a professional police department 
collaborative co collaboratively working with the community it serves. Community of policing is the professional policing community working with the general community that they serve collaboratively. Okay. So now I get to say, what is a community? And this is a complicated question and does not have a direct answer. I'm telling you that right now. A community is a group of people with similar understandings who live in a similar area or have similar beliefs. A community of policing is not just the police, it's the people they serve. There needs to be work together. And this is why the key components, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. If there was an exam question that said, what are the key components of community of policing? Or what are the key components to a community of policing? The answer might be that there needs to be the development of partnerships. The development of partnerships within the community and the police department. They're working together in multiple different capacities. This is Neighborhood Watch. This is having community members participate in activities. This is having police officers engage in community activities. This is having partnerships with social services where you have community and police officers working in similar roles together. A key component of, of uh, a community of policing is problem solving. It's understanding that things aren't just an easy one, too. It's understanding that you have to work together to understand and get to the root cause of a problem and to come up with a unique solution that works for the community. It is having education and transparency, knowing that everyone involved is properly educated on what are the roles and responsibilities of the police? What are the roles and responsibilities of the general population? What is the law? What is illegal? And it's transparency. It's not hiding or lying to each other. It's being open and working collaboratively. It's being accessible. It means a police department should be open to the public in general. And I don't mean like, oh, they have access to uh, our weaponry and our uh, evidence lockers. No, it's everyone is welcome in the police department. Everyone can, anyone in the general public in that community can access the department and talk to someone there and feel like they're allowed to be there, not like they are trespassing. And I skipped one in, in particular because it's my transition into our last slide. And that's organizational adaptation. A key part of a good, successful community of policing is having an organization that's adaptable. Being willing to change and bend to what is required. Adaptability is super important for a community of policing being able to adapt to the unique requirements of the community. And that's where I say the challenges to community policing. And I picked this picture for a very particular purpose. It is not impossible for a community of policing to happen. It is not impossible for police to be more willing and more understanding and and whatever it might be the problem is change takes time this is not something that happens overnight the biggest challenges to com the community of policing is the fact that change takes time change doesn't happen overnight and i want to emphasize that to anyone who is very strongly social justice or very strongly traditional justice or very pro-police, anti-police, whatever it might be, change takes time. I'll tell you right now, sometimes change is violent, but change takes time. And please understand that it does take time, okay? So when we talk about a community of policing, 
the big challenges other than it takes time is that when we talk about change, we're talking about culture shock. Like, really, we've talked about it already quite a bit. Police culture is very militaristic. It's very much we are a unique group and we are the protectors. We are the ones and the onlys. But in a community of policing, that's not true. You're a member of the community. The community is just as important. That's culture shock. That's a difficult thing to overcome for some people. And so it's it's a matter of breaking through the general culture of policing to say it's not like it was. And at the same time, it's going to be a culture shock to a, some populations and some communities. The police have always been the bad guy. Now seeing them that they're actually the good guys and they're trying to help us, that's a culture shock. Like I said, it's doable. It takes time and it's not easy. But it is possible. Culture shock is a big challenge to any type of community of policing. Motivation is a challenge. There, there has to be motivation to see the community of policing happening. And this comes from both the police department and from the general community. If, if the police department wants to do collaboration with the community, but the community wants nothing to do with it, it's not going to happen. If the general community wants to have more transparency and work more with the police, but the police just want to be a, for lack of a better word, police state where all they do is they enforce the laws and that's it, there's no motivation. The community policing is not going to happen. Motivation matters. Both sides need to agree to this. And truly, because change happens and it happens over time, it's navigating shifting parts. Because it takes time, there are people that are going to be in different positions of power when it happens and there's going to be people who come and go and it has to you have to understand that things are always changing change takes time and there's always going to be parts that are shifting so one of the other big challenges and this comes into uh this one and the last one, which is streamlined structure and decentralizing police. We're going to talk more about decentralizing police, but streamlined structure. Right now, the way it is, the centralized police structure is designed for efficiency. But changing to a community of policing is adding breaks into that streamline. Now it's not a straight, oh, it goes from step one, two, three, four, five, and onwards. Now it's, well, step one happens, and oh, we're going to have step 1A, 1B, 1C. Then we're going to go to two. You're adding extra people. You're adding other parts of this. Now that streamlined structure is gone. And so it seems like efficiency disappears, and so there's a pushback to community of policing because it's no longer streamlined. It's no longer straightforward. Obviously connected to uh, motivation, but foster collaboration. This is super important, especially with within policing to the community, not from the other way around. It's still important from community perspective to collaborate with police, but policing administration sometimes has this fear of collaborating with the community or fear of collaborating with other groups and truly the best way for community of policing to work is to foster collaboration the civilianization of officers this comes back to that culture and we talked about it before part of policing is that people go in with a strong sense of justice they become the police officer but understanding that they are a civilian. They still are a civilian, even though they're a police officer. This is a weird culture thing, and this is something that creates tension within this idea of a community of policing. Now I get to talk about decentralizing the police. Um, so as I said, our current model is a centralized police force, and this is the model that it's a top-down structure. This means there's that clear chain of command and a decision that's made at the top level is disseminated down through the ranks. And so essentially the lowest officer point, they just follow the rules. They follow what they're told from the department. 
it lacks any kind of autonomy and it makes it for that rigid follow the rules kind of the streamlined efficiency by having a centralized structure you ensure uniformity and you remove some flexibility the idea of decentralizing the police gives more autonomy to the officer so now instead of oh what was said at the top goes all the way down to the lowest officer. Now it's the top sets it, but every officer has a level of discretion that they have. They have a level of autonomy that they can deal with as they see fit. I'm sure I don't need to say it, but is there a possible issue with giving more autonomy to officers? Yes, we can give them too much autonomy or too much freedom. This is a complicated matter, and this is why I say there are challenges to community policing. Some of them are valid. Some of them are less valid. Modern policing, we are in a weird time where policing, like I said, is not the most popular job. And it's a matter of understanding what is the reality of this job, what is the reality of this career, and what can we do to build the bridge between this between the community and the police because remember the basic component of the police is that they serve the community that they are protecting we need to get back to that and so um yeah that's this week's lecture um i don't know i'll tell you right now um this week's quiz is all essay questions okay I'm telling you that right now, because a lot of this is theoretical, this is how things should operate, this week's quiz is designed to make you think about what we talked about this week, okay? That being said, I did give you hints on potential questions that were going to be on the final exam. So there are going to be other things that done, didn't come from the quiz this week that will be on the final exam. Uh, last thing that I want to say real quick, and I just want to go back a little bit, perception of the police. This is where I'm going to wrap up and say I am willing to do a potential little uh, extra credit assignment for anyone. Um, I will be posting it uh, later today or later tomorrow. Whenever this video gets posted, it'll be uh, within the next 24 hours. But it has to do with perceptions of the police. It might be asking you to come up with a marketing campaign for a police department to help build and improve community. That being said, uh, thank you very much. Good luck on the quiz and good luck on your analysis of the crime scene too. And I will see you in the next video.